Welcome to this, uh, the first in the UCL European Institute series of podcasts. My name's uh, Tim Beasley-Murray. I'm Senior Lecturer in European Thought and Culture at UCL, and I'm one of the European Institute's fellows. And it's a huge uh, pleasure to uh, introduce today and to welcome um, Dr. Andrew Smith from UCL History Department. And we're here to talk to Andrew about his new book, uh, published by Manchester University Press, with this wonderful title, Terror and Terroir, the wine growers of the Languedoc and modern France. So, Andrew, um, welcome to the European Institute podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, this book, uh, mm. which I have in front of me with this uh, magnificent Buvet Francais, drink French wine <laughs> on the front of it, um, tells the story of the struggle of wine growers in, in the Languedoc region, so in the southern, uh, mm. southern part of France, and sure. their struggle uh, uh, in the face of increasing pressures um, on their industry uh, to, to support their wine growing. Could you tell us a bit about how you came to this topic and this fascinating story which you tell here? Absolutely. Um, it's something I've actually been passionate about for a long time. Um, it's not very controversial to say that I've always enjoyed my wine. Um, I've also uh, found really that uh, I've been really interested in the history of that region as well. Um, I came to, first of all, my uh, my dad was a wine merchant. Um, and so from a young age, I got quite involved in the wine industry through seeing his work and, uh, and talking to him about it. And actually, it was when I was the, an undergraduate at the University of St Andrews, I was trying to figure out what to do for my dissertation as an undergraduate. And uh, my supervisor there, Stephen Tyre, um, said to me, well, what kind of things are you interested in? I said, well, very interested in French history, um, very interested in you know labour politics and ideas of trade unions and all the rest of it. And I'm also really interested in wine as well. And he said, well, what's your favourite wine? I said, well, absolutely, it's Fitou. Um, and so he said, well, how do these things come together? Oh. So I went away and I did a bit of research and I came back with this really quite odd story about wine growers in the south of France, trade unionism and real militant trade unionism about violence, about passion, about identity, about things which went much further than just the production of wine, but actually entered into a sort of struggle for survival and attempt to dictate and negotiate what modernity meant to them. Something to dictate how the country treated its peasantry. All of these issues seem to tie themselves together and suggest something really quite interesting. Um, so it really came from you know, my own personal interest and then moving forward into, through my actual study as, as an undergraduate as well. Um, when it came to uh, applying for a PhD, I think that's how I sold it to my, my supervisor at Queen Mary, Julian Jackson, um, as really just, we'll talk about wine. Um, and uh, I think that was the, the main selling point. Um, I mean... The I think one of the really fascinating things about this book is that it tells the story of a region. It seems mm. to be a focus on the small, these particular uh, wine growers in, in Languedoc, and what, what's more, their particular organisation, this uh, Comité Régional d'Action Viticole, or whatever it is, that develops into, as you say, this incredibly violent violent group at, at points in its history. But it also engages with, with, with a much broader picture. It's about the region, but it's also about the Algerian war and decolonization, or it's about 1968, or it's about globalization. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more about the way in which looking at something small, or that seems to be small, a regional a group of wine growers, can tell us about much larger questions? Yeah, absolutely. And it's something I've been really passionate about. Um, one of the other things I've, I've researched in the past was the, the Loi Cadre, um, a big legal reform in French West Africa in 1956. And one of the things that really interested me about that was the idea that it was written by a chap called Gaston de Fer. Um, he's one of the kind of principal authors of the law. Now, he was actually one of the principal authors of the 1981 decentralization law in France. And I remember a while back thinking, isn't it interesting that you have one man dealing with decentralization in the colonies, just as he's dealing with decentralization in the regions. And for me, this idea of the, the idea of the periphery in France became something that was quite telling for me. And actually, I started to see more and more instances in which people use quite similar vocabulary to talk mm. about the regions and to talk about empire. Now, I think for me, the really passionate thing, what, what I initially became passionate about was this, this individual story, was this idea of the craft. Who are they? What is this story? How can we account for the development? But increasingly, as I studied that development, I found more and more that it as you said, snaked out and tied into these much broader issues. 
So there is no Krav if there is no Algerian war. If those men don't come back from fighting, from being reservists, uh, from being called up um, uh, to, to, to fight in France's decolonisation struggle, they don't learn the methods that actually produces the Krav. If we don't have France's engagement with Europe and in, uh, European integration with a common agricultural policy and all these other things, we don't have the same drive for the French government to reform its countryside. If it doesn't respond to globalisation in the same way, it doesn't shape the language and uh, breed the sort of alliances that the Krav form with other movements. So for me, although the story starts really looking out from the vines up and out uh, from the Languedoc, it's one which does always look beyond the region as well, because I think it has to do so. Um, I don't really like starting in Paris and looking down towards the region. I actually am much, much keener to get really down and dirty, to get in amongst the vines and see what the world looks like from there. Well, let's start there, in amongst the vines. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought along, incidentally, a bottle of wine, a Domaine Laborie. It's from the region, so yeah. I'll pour some here. Yeah. Um, but, and let's also start with this crucial concept that you have in the title of the book. Mm. And I, as I say, I love this terror and terroir. What yeah. is the terroir? What does, what does terroir mean? What does wine mean? Not just for France as a whole. We know it's mm -hmm. this totemic symbol of Frenchness that yeah. Roland Barthes talks mm -hmm. about. But what does it mean in Languedoc or in, in Hérault or in these little places? this in the, in the southwestern France? What does terroir mean and what does wine mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, terroir is one of, these, uh, one of these big concepts, isn't it? There's a reason we don't translate it in English because of this uh, idea that it is a sort of uh, mystical and almost romantic idea. It talks about a sort of quasi-religious union of soil, of method, of atmosphere, of, of history as well. And that's something which is, I think... There's always this, this difficulty of saying something's almost uniquely French, but it's something which is quite redolent of French ideas. When Bart talks about a totem drink, I think there's a reason for that. Because what it does is it builds in certain um, a certain idea of the land, you could say. Um, and I think really that's what roots it in the region. So, of course, France becomes regionalised. It comes to, uh, to look at its uh, cuisine as being inherently regionalised. It ties identity to the region. And that's something that develops right after the revolution, um, right from the revolution, I should say. Um, so it, it's really important. Down south as well, when we talk about wine, you know, we can wax lyrical about the romance of wine and all the rest of it. But one of the things about the Languedoc in particular is that this is and it's a horrible way to put it, and actually I've had people from the region get annoyed about me saying it, but it becomes almost an industrial drink um, in the Languedoc. It's, it's a monoculture. It's something that's produced in such huge quantities that it is the, the, um, the wine cellar of Europe. And this is both its greatest blessing and its greatest curse. So when you get this kind of violence, when you get this passion, when you get this, this mobilisation, it's not just because of romantic ideas of wine, of the love of land, of history and all the rest of it. But it's also tied, I think, to this idea just of economic necessity. Um, for the wine growers of the Languedoc, wine and the wine industry is really what uh, shipbuilding represented to Glasgow and Newcastle. And as it declines, it's something which isn't just a sort of uh, romantic idea, as I said, but it's something which really hits home. It's something which affects the actual home life of ordinary people. It affects them living. It affects their ability to survive and live in the region. Um, and I think that's really quite important. Um, great. Well, we, we've, we've started with the wine and uh, Santé, uh, Andrew. Santé. Here, here we go. Um, let's try and tell something of this story that, that you've already hinted at. Um, the story of a region, of a group of people protecting their terroir, protecting their way of life, protecting their wine. And this story starts uh, the way you tell it in your book with a date that won't be familiar perhaps to many people mm. here, which is 1907. Sure. Can you tell us why 1907 is in a sense the starting point for, for what you're talking talking about in your book. Absolutely. 1907 is uh, a high watermark um, in the region. It's a high watermark in France as well. And I think especially in, um, in the English language literature, um, it's somewhat neglected. It's a huge mobilisation. People call it the Grand Revolt. It culminates in a, uh, in a movement um, which sees 600,000 people in the streets of Montpellier. This is a really significant social movement. Um, I think this is also about... France's uh, peripheries kind of almost seeming to rise up in revolt. There's a lot of people that worry this is some sort of um, regional revolt. But the story starts, as all these things do, in the region. Um, it starts with market crises. It starts with problems. It starts with organisation against the iniquities of the market. And actually what's set out there is an ideology which stays there the entire time. So we get a series of uh, sales crises um, because the market overheats. 
after it recovers from the phylloxera virus. The phylloxera virus infects most of France from the 1860s. It's a tiny louse um, which eats into the, uh, the, the roots of the vines, um, the um, vitis vinifera, the noble vine. Um, it devastates European wine. Um, and it's, it's ironic because this is a louse that comes from America sure. when American vines are imported to rejuvenate Absolutely. the stock in the south of France. And a lot of the book is actually a story, well, a simplification would be it's a, st- a struggle against Americanization and for, well, perhaps, I don't know. But anyway, the louse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so this is, as you say, it's, um, it's brought across uh, American vines and actually ends up with American vines being the solution. These are the resistant vines, so... Um, the, the noble vine, Vitis vinifera, is uh, grafted onto the, um, the the American vine, Vitis lambusca, um, and that's what creates a kind of a hybrid which allows production to um, to grow again. But when that is uh, when that's achieved and that problem is is solved, um, the Languedoc reinvests in wine in a big way, and production explodes. It's um, it's driven by the railways, by the early recovery, um, and it really sees a huge concentration, a huge focus on wine. It almost goes in too hard, too fast. And that market quickly becomes crowded, quickly becomes overheated, quickly becomes subject to very rapid and very extreme um, vacillations uh, of price, um, which really, really affects uh, the industry. Now, the difficulty is a lot of people suspect fraud um, because when times are hard, people cut corners and people try and find a way to make things work when their lives depend on it. And there's a real suspicion that there's uh, there's fraud and sugaring going on, this capitalisation that we were talking about just beforehand, um, which actually uh, is seen to be a way of, of bolstering quality um, fraudulently. So there's a huge campaign that grows, um, launched after a, an unsuccessful round of... Uh, of protests in 1905 when they can't really get the um, the different sides together. The uh, the wine labourers won't cooperate with the, uh, the proprietors of small vineyards. That's overcome in 1907 when a movement is launched by Marcelin Albert, a small cafe owner from, uh, from Argelier, um, who really campaigns on the idea that the Languedoc needs to be saved. And this is one of the big things he articulates, a simple message which crosses all boundaries. He looks to Parliament and says, save us, help us. Um, There's a famous deputy from the region who actually goes to Parliament and says, you are the doctor, cure us. Um, And so there's a real sense that the Longerock needs to to kind of get this intervention, that the problems are too endemic to be solved by itself, and it needs that outside intervention. And the argument you, you, you're making in, this, in the book is that the protests of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s and so on mm-hmm. are continually referring back to these, this, this mythical moment of 1907 with its 600,000 demonstrators in Montpellier and so on mm-hmm. as a point of reference, giving the same sort of message to, to the French government, save Languedoc, invest in our wines, protect us from, mm-hmm. from foreign wines and so on. Um, how does this then transform in the 60s and eventually 70s to the sort of wine terrorism, ultimately, that it gets branded? How does this turn to violence? What's happening, particularly in the 70s, I think you're describing, extreme violence is happening throughout southern France. How does this, 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 this movement, which is, is asking for Paris to save Languedoc, turn into some sort of running battle with the French authorities? Sure, yeah. Well, f- from 1907, um, the movement essentially fades out um, after Marcelin Albert is sort of tainted um, by his meeting with uh, Georges Clemenceau, um, and you get the, a sort of fizzling out of this huge movement. It comes to very little. There's the establishment of a very big representative body, the CGVM, and that's one of the constants that we see right throughout this period. There are also some reforms to the wine market. There's a big reform in the in the 1930s, the Statut Viticole, um, which is meant to kind of institute a sort of social attitude to wine. Um, it's, it's sort of uh, remembered fondly by the wine growers of the post-war. But of course, the big thing that really affects um, this is, as well, uh, the occupation. Um, and Vichy has a very a negative attitude um, to, to alcohol in general, um, but also a very negative attitude to the industry. Um, they authorise the kind of uh, the release of Piquette, um, second press wines, um, Van de Mark, you know, th- things which are, are really low quality. And they debase and create a huge black market for, for wine. So when it comes to the, the post-war period, there's a need to kind of resettle all these ideas. There's a need to kind of get all this worked out to get the, the, the industry, the sector back on a legitimate framework, back on a legitimate footing, I should say. Um, now, what comes from that, first of all, is a, is a huge spike 
of uh, cooperatives, um, which allows people who are you know growing small amounts of wine but can't produce uh, high quality wines themselves to to give that wine to to a winery and um, to have their their grape juice turned into wine um, as a collective, not to invest in an expensive material. Um, so there's a boom in cooperatives, and that's one of the key things. Another key point is that this is the age of engineers. It's the age of the Monet plan. Um, it's an age in which we see people like Etienne Hirsch say that, you know, um, in France, farmers n- no longer need to follow um, horses. And that actually, a farmer thinks differently driving a tractor than he does following a horse. But the difficulty is that some people can't buy those tractors. Some people can't afford to gamble on this modernization. So we have a situation in which there's a, a spike in the uh, the number of cooperatives in the um, late 40s, early 50s. We also have a situation in which the government is keen to promote uh, modernisation and mechanisation of vineyards, which is um, injurious to a lot of small growers. And actually, this leads to a, a number of um, protests and crises throughout the 1950s as different representative groups try and say, well, this is dreadful. <laughs> we need to find a way around this. You get different groups trying to represent small growers, big growers, all this sort of thing. And it's a big mess throughout the 1960s. What cuts the knot of this mess, this alphabet soup of different representational groups, is the movements of the uh, the early 1960s, when we see the Comité Régional d'Action Viticole created, really formalised in 1961. Now, it's formalised around a similar message to what Marcel and Albert put across as well. It cuts across class, it cuts across different sectors, different growers, and it says, look, we need to take action because things aren't happening. And straight away what the Crave says, founded by André Castera, who's this totemic figure, he's called the Christ of the Corbière, you know, they call him uh, Castera le Terrible, you know, he's seen as being this huge um, scholarly figure almost, who kind of wears the, you know, um, the depredations of the region on his face and this kind of gaunt, uh, gravelly voice and all the rest of it. He, he forms the, the Crave at this meeting in Narbonne and, and says, essentially, their task is to intervene when dialogue is blocked. There's a sense that for all the discussion of the 1950s, for all the different um, groups that you have, something needs to be done. Someone needs to kind of shortcut, short circuit these uh, these discussions and kind of take the fight to the government effectively. Now that is massively bolstered by a group of what you might call young hotheads who gather around a chap called André Caz. Now André Caz has been he's done his 30 mois, you know, 30 odd months of service in Algeria. He came back like a lot of his fellows to villages which were still in crisis, problems which still hadn't been solved. And these found themselves in a region, having been fighting in, uh, in one of France's uh, colonial struggles, to say, well, what really have we got from this? And actually, whose side are we really on? And actually, there's, a, there's a, one of the really fascinating things for me is the way in which the vocabulary of anti, anti-colonial struggles creeps into this. And we get a lot of activists in the Languedoc and actually also in Brittany who start saying that they're carrying out attacks using the methods of Algerian freedom fighters, of Algerian liberation movement, cutting telephone poles, you know, striking against the government. That's really kind of quite a, a strong moment. That's the reason, I think, for the violence. Uh, and and uh, that's though you have some fantastic quotations where they're referring to their experiences in Algeria and almost learning from the insurgents in Algeria, despite mm-hmm. the fact that, you know, in that area, you say their sympathies might have been with the Pied Noir and so on, but they are learning from Algerian insurgents. However, these are not separatist movements, are they? And it's something you're, you're clear to emphasise throughout your book. These are Republican protesters, as it were. Could you say something about some of that tension? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's really interesting because you look at something like the Crav and you look at this sort of rural protest and especially this sort of really passionate and violent rural protest and immediately people start talking about Dorgère and fascism. People start talking about Pujad and sort of um, what you might call kind of petty kind of shopkeeper fascism almost. Um, and actually... For the craft, there's really not a huge subscription to those sorts of movements. They don't really see themselves as, as political. They're not interested in a programme. They don't have a, a manifesto. This is a group who intervene in very specific debates about agriculture, about wine, really just in their own interest, not in service of some grand cause. And that, that's really interesting for me because, as you say, you, you have this strong Republican heritage. These are mostly socialist voters, um, but of the kind of the evolutionary socialism uh, camp, you might say. They, they, they vote really according to their loyalties in the region. 
there are some communists involved. Uh, Emmanuel Maffre de Bogé is a, is a very um, key figure involved, who is a communist, but a rather kind of um, esoteric figure, I think you'd say, as well. Um, but really, there's a huge loyalty to, uh, to the Socialist Party and to Republican politics. There's a, there's a telling moment um, just after the elections triggered by the 1968 events in which André Castera um, says he's going to stand against the, um, the sitting socialist candidate to say, well, you know, things aren't happening. People aren't helping us. We're not getting what we want from the Socialist Party. Let's shortcut them again. But actually, he describes all of his uh, comrades, all of his friends in tears, saying, we want to support you. We want to vote for the wine growers. But I'm a socialist, man, you know? They talk about these loyalties, these party loyalties, and won't actually give them up. So really, there's a long-running association with Republican politics, with the left, especially, um, and no sort of uh, flirtation with any sort of um, unusual uh, modes of fascism, certainly in this period, or anything you know, of that sort of radical right suggestion. I mean, one other group that one might, as, an, as a newcomer to this topic, be tempted to associate the crowd with would be regional separatism. And um, in one very interesting chapter, you trace the relationship between ideas of, of uh, the Occitan language movement and the Crav and this whole idea of Occitania. Um, it's quite interesting. At the beginning, you talk about the way in which Frédéric Mistral, the, the great poet and c- cultural figure of, of, of Occitan um, Occitan cultural figure mm-hmm. rejects any association with the movement in 1907, yeah. but then you say that in the 1960s there's a there's a sort of coming together with a new form of Occitan nationalism and the interests of these wine growers. Can you tell us something about the, those relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it, it's partly tied to the evolution of the minority nationalist movement, um, of the the regionalist movement, of Occitanism. Um, there's a broader period uh, periodization of those sorts of regional movements. Uh, which tends to follow uh, the kind of Breton model of emshavs or kind of uprisings or awakenings, and um, perhaps the best way to translate that. And the first one of those usually is uh, seen to be taking place in about the 1890s. Um, you tend to get this first emshav um, kind of flavour, I suppose you'd say, of what I tend to call Rotary Club nationalism, if you see what I mean. Um, very wealthy people who are highly educated, often investigating culture, heritage, patrimony, language, medieval poetry, etc., etc. And it's in that sort of constituency that someone like Mistral is able to really draw on a lot of loyalty. Um, and that, he's very much a, a, a first Emshav figure, I think, um, if you're going to use that Breton terminology. The second um, Emshav usually is seen to be taking place in about the 1920s and 30s, and that, embro- that it involves a broader politicisation of those uh, methods, uh, a kind of it's a horrible word, but massification, I suppose, of um, all, all those ideas. It expands to, to talk about mass politics. Um, now, especially in France, the difficulty is that you see a lot of those movements come to be associated with people like Charles Maurras, um, come to be associated with collaboration, come to be associated with Nazism, effectively, as um, the movement which seeks to destroy the French state. Um, now... The 1960s obviously are different. We're talking about a different period. And this is what people tend to talk about as the third M. Schaff. Um, and actually what this is generally represented by is the sense of a new left, of new social movements, and actually minority nationalist movements, which after a hiatus of the, you know, almost 20 years since the liberation, re-emerge into active politics, looking for new allies, new ways to get that message across. And that's very true for the Occitanese in, in particular, I think. It emerges out of a new constituency of southern sociologists at universities like Montpellier and Perpignan, where people start to talk about the language of uh, of Occitan, but also the sense of a social movement, of Occitan identity and what that can contribute to the region. And I think one of the really crucial points in the alliance between the wine growers, or the kind of défense movement, as I call it, and the, the Occitanists is one of vocabulary. Because for the Occitanists, when they talk about the land, they're not talking about it in some, you know, Morassian integralist tone. They're talking about it in, uh, in a tone which talks about natural, organic things, about slowing down life, about moving away from industrialism, about the kind of the, the association with the, the land that we talk about with the new left, the sort of, essentially, if you want to be glib about it, a sort of hippie movement association with the land. And when they talk about wanting to live and work in the land, volem de Yuri Alpes is one of the, um, the, the key slogans, we want to live in our country. That really resonates with the wine growers movement 
this desire really just to live and work the land. You know, you do what you do in Paris. You carry on with your modernization, your globalization, and do what you like up there. But actually, could we just grow our wine and live our life in this land that is ours? and has been our fathers and before us, etc., etc. And that, for me, is the really big and interesting coalition that really happens. It's nothing really hugely formal. It's more of a coalition of interests, a sort of confluence of ideas, I think, between Ock and Vine, as I put it in the, in the book. And I think that that pitch you described there is something we might be familiar with today. I mean, one thing I was thinking about was the slow food movement in Italy and so on. And these more gentle reactions against globalization and, and some of its pernicious effects. Nevertheless, the crab are pretty violent. And I want to come back to this. You know, the, the, if we talked about 1907, the other big date, I think, is 1976 that you talk about. And this is a major incident in Montredon, which ends up with two deaths. Could you talk about how we get how this campaign of direct action of sabotage and so on ends up in, in the terrible violence there and how afterwards the, the, the people involved have sought to deal with, with, with a, a high point of violence. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is really, it's, um, we talk about radicalization nowadays and it's one of these words that tends to carry a lot of baggage, especially religious baggage. But what we're seeing here is a cycle of radicalization which is tied to mobilization. Um, this is something which really takes off from about 1967, um, the summer before uh, the, the great 1968 is when it really kicks off down south, I think you'd say. And actually, this is a moment when you see huge waves of protests. And from that moment, it's almost like people never dial it down again. Um, the wine growers movement, once it gets this, uh, this bravery, once it becomes emboldened by its successes in 67, its ability to put people on the streets and gain concessions from government, it never really says, we have to back down. And from 67, um, there are descriptions of the, the wine girls almost entering into a period of what's called open warfare with the police. Um, because of the, the style of French policing in which the CRS are, are quite interventionist, are quite uh, heavily mobilised, have quite a lot of autonomy in terms of trying to, um, to bait and kind of uh, to combat individual groups, we really enter into a series of uh, cat and mouse struggles between the wine growers and the CRS, which run from the 70s um, right up until that fateful day um, at Montredon. Um, now, what you, what you see really there, what, what, what this comes from, is battles, really, um, between the crav, between you know, hardcore cravists and the CRS. And they talk about you know, it being one of the, um, the rites of passage for young guys in the region. You know, you team up with your mates and then go and battle it out with the police. That's one of the things that makes you a man in the region. It's one of the things that means you're a wine girl that's earned his spurs. It lets them see that you're committed to this cause in that sense. And actually these constant struggles just produce a huge amount of resentment. Accusations of provocation on every side, resentment, suspicion, and always throughout this, an intractable crisis of wine. Now, there are other movements at the time. As we said, it's, this, is, this is the period in which we get these alliances with the, uh, with the, with the Occitan movement. Huge movements like Larzac, which are seen as, as non-violent, but lend weight to this sense, to this, this zeitgeist of confrontation, of, of rising, of mobilisation, of articulacy, which is taking place um, by people that are challenging the French state. All of these things, 68 too, contribute to this sense that things are going to change. Now, the immediate lead-up to 76 is, uh, first of all, some attacks on a blending house. Uh, the Ramel blending house, in which people suspect there is the blending of Spanish or uh, uh, of foreign wines with, um, with French wines to create an inferior product, fraudulent product, effectively. And really, then the CRS again meet that demonstration with a lot of violence. And there's a sort of um, counter-protest in which uh, a group of men walk to Montredon with rifles. And this is one of the big points of the region. It's the hunting rifles. These are for shooting boar in the countryside. It's, a, again, a sort of peasant pursuit, as we might say. So they, they carry their rifles really in a show of defiance. Now, the difficulty is that the police meet them at Montredon, and there's a standoff, a huge standoff. And, of course, the CRS are armed, the wine growers are armed, and what transpires is a real tragedy. Nobody knows to this day who shot first. Um, there are claims from both sides about what happens. This is the kind of thing we might expect. What we do know is that there's a huge amount of people wounded and two people are killed, one on each side. We have a, a, a wine grower killed, uh, Emile Poitez. Um, we also have um, a, a CRS officer uh, killed, Joël Le Goff. Um, now, when you have um, Commodore Le Goff killed and, and Poitez, this, this really kind of it's bloodshed on both sides. It becomes something which is really seen to be uh, a scary moment. 
Um, it comes at the same time as separatist movements in Corsica have been involved in armed standoffs. And so for the for the for, for the ordinary man on the street, for your you know Parisian newspaper reader, w- what is this? This is regional violence. This is extremism. This is you know more craziness in the countryside that needs to be put a stop to. For the wine growers, this is the culmination of a century of struggle. This is, you know, the series of, you know, yet again the CRS coming hard when they let other things go. This is really about a, a way that those narratives are perceived. So 1976 is at the heart of it, a very horrible human tragedy. But it's also something which really entrenches the narrative on both sides um, of unreasonable, violent, you know, mobilising peasants, but also an uncaring, militant, violent state which is seeking to put them down at every opportunity. So it's a tragedy, I think, of of many layers. Now, ultimately, your book shows that this campaign of violence doesn't succeed. Another important date is 1984, Mm. where you tell of how um, the Crav, I think they set fire to enormous Leclerc Mm. and lose public support in this, not least because uh, it's a very interesting anecdote, if you don't mind. Edouard Leclerc, the owner of the supermarket chain, then comes and says, well, actually, 24% of the wine we we sell in our supermarkets is from your area Mm. and 0.1% from abroad. And this seems to mark a turning point. Um, But I wanted to ask a more, more, more general question, I guess. In some ways, your book is a story of a, of a, of a social movement's failure. Mm-hmm. Right at the beginning, you used the metaphor of, or one of your quotations uses the metaphor of uh, Don Quixote mm-hmm. and the way in which he's tilting at windmills. And in a sense, these cravists, you know, who we could r- perhaps romanticize despite their violence, are Don Quixote and Sancho Panza tilting at the windmills of modernity. Is this a fair, fair characterization or, 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 or would you like to nuance that characterization in some way? <laughs> I think it's broadly fair. Um, I, it's an interesting one because I, I actually, you know, I find when I'm looking at it myself, I am broadly sympathetic to what they're trying to do. I'm broadly sympathetic to their struggle. I'm not sympathetic to the methods. I'm not sympathetic to the, you know, the, the, the kind of the absurd levels of violence that grow out of the movement. But I can see where the frustration comes from. I can see where the arguments come from. I can understand the vocabulary in which they're voiced. And I think really it is about the failure of a social movement because they, they can't stand against the tide of history, effectively. They seem to be promoting something which is really against the the direction of travel in Europe at that time, in France at that time, in the world at that time. Um, This is, you know, about peasants. One of the books that really inspired me with this um, was that idea of peasants into Frenchmen, you know, that that old classic book. Uh, And I find it really interesting as well. In 1992, when the Crave are called terrorists, it's a Colonel Weber that calls them terrorists uh, of the police. And that, for me, is just a hugely evocative moment, you know, when Weber's calling these uh, peasants terrorists. Um, Different man, obviously, but, you know. Um, And I think, really, that is a... um, a telling sense of this, there's a real sense of what they're standing against, that they have a lot of agency in this. This isn't about the transformation of peasants into Frenchmen. This is really about peasants defining themselves, the terms of their own identity, of articulating the parameters of their own Frenchness. This is an attempt by a group in the countryside to really take a stand and say, what is it we want to do with our lives? Now, ultimately, as I said, it's it's misguided. This, This violence that creeps into the movement is ultimately flawed and counterproductive. When they, as you say, when they torch the Leclerc, it's, it's not something which is, you know, a, a wake-up call to the establishment, but it's something which is much, uh, uh, much less effective, something which is foolish in many ways. Well, just finally then, let's let's turn that narrative failure on its head and, and think, you know, in, 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 if, if the Crave and the, these vignerons of the South France were victims of globalisation, we're talking about that a lot today, mm-hmm. the way in which, um, you know, the voices of those who've been overlooked by globalisation need to be listened to more carefully. What are the positive messages that we can take from the winemakers of southern France and the Crave and their struggle? What, what, what does your book say to, you know, post-Brexit Britain or, or, and so on? What, what's the positive? Positive message. I think there are positive method, uh, positive messages um, which come into uh, the story of the crowd, especially in their alliance um, with the, uh, the minority nationalist movement, the Occitanists, largely because what they focus on is the way in which regional heritage, regional patrimony can be a force for positive social change in the region. They ally it to, to social movements, to labour struggles, and it becomes something about defining a, a sort of a vision of the go- a vision of the future, which is not necessarily anti-globalisation, but really outer globalisation, looking at different terms of engagement, talking about the, the value of a peasant lifestyle. We mentioned ideas of slow food, for example, and I think that's something which is really compelling. We see people like Ose Bové involved in this movement through Larzac and all the rest of it. This, I think, the alternative of more sustainable production, more organic production, things which look to be more rooted 
in our own local areas talks about something really positive. The book ends really by talking about the idea of you know moving away from at, uh, from from different types of attacks into what they call AMAPs and these ideas of new types of distribution, new types of more sustainable local engagement, and about how different communities can organise themselves. I think that focus on community, that focus on identity, that way in which we can engage and help and have a positive change in those around us is a very positive message if you strip away the violence. Okay, so more terroir and less terror is what we're talking about. (laughs) Um, Andrew, it's been a real pleasure. We've been talking about Andrew Smith's book, Terror and Terroir, The Wine Growers of the Languedoc and Modern France, uh, out with Manchester University Press, on this, our first uh, UCL European Institute podcast. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim.